All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is Spenseri's Weekly Journal Club, which is part of our open science uh, strategy. We hope that everybody enjoys them. Um, this week, we have with us, and actually, hopefully, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Eliezer. Uh, Eliezer. That's how I was going to say it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dr. David Eliezer, who is professor of biochemistry at Cornell University, interested in the function of several proteins involved in neurodegeneration, including one that I've had a love-hate relationship over the past 20 years with, which is alpha-synuclein. So we're looking forward to hearing you talk. And uh, specifically, uh, this is going to cover work that was recently published in NPJ Parkinson's disease titled Alpha-Synuclein Modulates Mitochondrial Calcium Uptake from ER During Cell Stimulation and Under Stress Conditions. Uh, with that, I will pass it right over to you. And uh, thank you so much again for taking the time to present this to us. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. You know, we scientists always like to talk about our work, so I appreciate the opportunity. And I hope that maybe we'll have some time for discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, yes, I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about our work on alpha-synuclein as a protein we've been working with for a very long time. Um, and this work is rooted in trying to understand structure function relationships uh, of this protein really as it relate, they relate to uh, synaptic vesicle exocytosis and it led to a mitochondrial story and, and perhaps even a story that's related to pathology uh, or pathogenesis uh, that I'll get to in the end. So um, before I start, I want to acknowledge first my collaborators, Barbara Baird and David Holoka. There's a lot of cell biology uh, in this talk. It was uh, done uh, in their lab, sometimes by my student, Tapo Das, and sometimes by their student, M. A. Raj Ramazani. And there was a previous graduate student, MD, PhD student, David Sneed, who was also responsible for some of the work. So I want to acknowledge them. And of course, we couldn't do anything without uh, money from the NIH. And in this particular case, also some facilities uh, New York Structural Biology Center in particular. So uh, with that, I presume that I don't need to spend too much time introducing alpha-synuclein uh, to this audience, but I want to mention that most people probably in this audience in the world are in interested in alpha-synuclein for what's illustrated in the top part of this slide here, which is the fact that it's deposited uh, in the brains of people who die with Parkinson's disease in the form of Lewy bodies that are depicted here. And that within those Lewy bodies, it takes the form of amyloid fibrils. And now, thanks to Michel Goudel and uh, Shores Cherez, we have uh, models of those fibrils extracted from human brains with either MSA or LBD, PD, uh, at atomic resolution. And, and so they look like this, and that's really fantastic. Nevertheless, the, the cause and effect relationship between uh, amyloid and Parkinson's disease or amyloid and amyloid diseases remains difficult to understand. So some time ago, we decided to devote some part of the lab to wondering about and trying to clarify something even more poorly understood about alpha-synuclein, which is what is its normal function. And so we started at presynaptic nerve terminals because it was named synuclein because it was first purified from preps of synaptic vesicles from electric eels. And it was shown over the years in a variety of, of papers, not very many of them, to have various effects on things that relate to the synaptic vesicle cycle. So this is where we focused our attention first. Um, and in a previous paper in NPJ Parkinson's disease that we published in 2019, we described the results of our attempts to understand the structure function relationships of alpha-synuclein as they relate to vesicle release. And we did not work in neurons, unfortunately, because we didn't have the ability to do so. So instead we worked in model cells, but it turned out in a way to be an advantage. So this slide, summarizes the results of that paper, and I won't go through them in detail. We were able to establish some um, correlations between what we observed in these model cells that are called RBL2H3 cells, and these are the same cells in which all of the work that I'll tell you about today was performed almost all the work. We did also do some work in N2A cells um, and HEK cells, but most of the work was in this RBL2H3 model line. It's a model for an immune system cell, and it's a sort of professional secretory cell. So we thought it was a reasonable place to study vesicle release. And we drew analogies to what other people had observed in neurons looking at actual synaptic vesicles, which is presumably where at least a large fraction of alpha-synuclein is exerting its normal physiological functions. And the main thing I want to point out here is that a lot of our work was based on a model that's been a... Um, a paradigm in the lab for, for much of our interest in functional aspects of alpha-synuclein. And that model posits that alpha-synuclein uh, interacts with synaptic vesicles in a mode that allows it to bridge between the vesicle and the plasma membrane. 
Okay, and I think I have that illustrated on the next slide again. So, so this is our working model of alpha synuclein, uh, the context for alpha synuclein function of presynaptic nerve terminals, and it posits that uh, this protein is largely cytosolic. If you look at it, most cell types and 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 stain for it uh, or fluorescently label it. So much of it is in the cytosol, and we and others, not everyone, but many believe that uh, in the cytosol it's largely disordered. It is well known to bind to a variety of membranes, but it prefers highly negatively charged and highly curved membranes like synaptic vesicles. And so uh, we believe that it samples the surface of a variety of members, membranes, but especially synaptic vesicles. When it does so, it undergoes an ordering transition where a large part of the protein becomes helical. And then uh, less clear, but an important part of our model, and it is based on in vitro structural biology, uh, is that the protein can adopt a so-called broken helix state where the single long helix uh, develops a unstructured linker region between two now shorter helices. And the, the real hypothesis of our model is that this state allows the protein to bridge between different membranes and a presynaptic nerve terminals, in particular to bridge between synaptic vesicles and the plasma membrane. And, and in this way, position the protein to influence vesicle release, which of course is mediated by more important proteins like snares and monks and other rabs and other proteins that are not depicted here. So um, some of the observations that led us to this model uh, included localizations of alpha synuclein at uh, docked vesicles at uh, synaptic junctions, and, and also purifications of synaptic vesicles uh, from rodent brains usually, uh, where very pure synaptic vesicles that are no longer attached to any other membranes have no alpha synuclein, they only have vesicle proteins on them resident vesicle proteins like the V-snare or synaptophysin. But uh, a precursor to these very pure synaptic vesicles, vesicles that are still attached to membranes, so among these are docked vesicles, these have a lot of alpha-synuclein associated with them, as they do T-snares, things that are on the, on the membrane side, not on the vesicle side. So these kind of data uh, supported our notion that alpha-synuclein can bind more tightly when it's presented with two closely opposed membranes, as with a vesicle docked at the plasma membrane. So uh, the paper in 2019 uh, tested this idea and together with a, a later paper in 2022, we had sort of two things that we wanted to show. One is that this binding mode uh, could happen. And so that requires each of these helices to be able to bind membranes independently. So that's the first thing I wanna show you here. And I won't belabor this. This is sort of fairly sophisticated NMR dark state exchange data. And I don't think anybody here would like me to go into the details of that, but if people are interested, I can. Suffice to say that the uh, y-axis here represents the ability of this these various regions of the protein to bind. This is the residue number throughout alpha synuclein sequence. It's 140 residue protein. So the first 100 residues, as I told you, bind to membranes for the wild-type protein. And if we stick four glycine residues in this linker region, and the reason we put four glycines in is because glycine is a poor helix former, and so a sequence of glycine residues is really unable to form to bridge helical structure between one region and another region. So by putting four glycines in, we completely decouple the ability of this N-terminal helix to communicate with this C-terminal helix. We still get binding of the N-terminal helix and of the C-terminal helix, except at the linker region. And this shows that each of these helices can bind to membranes independently, which as I said, is required for this model to hold water. So that was one important result. The other important result was of course, to do structure function and so, for this, we used a fluorin assay, which monitors the buildup of fluorescence on the cell membrane as vesicles are released. There is a fluorophore that's situated inside the vesicle lumen that's quenched with low pH. When the vesicles merge with the plasma membrane, that fluorophore is exposed to the extracellular neutral pH and it fluoresces, and you get a buildup of fluorescence on the membrane. So you can take movies monitoring the fluorescence um, that you see in the samples on the membrane. And if you take cells that are not transfected with alpha-synuclein and you stimulate them, you guys probably, I'll get, it doesn't really matter how we stimulate in this case, but in this case, we use taptic argon, so it leads to a buildup of calcium in the cytoplasm. You get fluorescence on the surface of the cell. If you transfect these cells with wild type alpha-synuclein, alpha-synuclein inhibits the release of vesicles, and so you get less fluorescence building up on the cells. And then based on this model of two helices bridging between the vesicle and the plasma membrane, we designed a novel mutation placing a proline residue of position 70, designed to disrupt the ability of helix 2 to bind uh, the membrane and that mutation abrogates the ability of alpha-synuclein to inhibit vesicle secretion in these cells. So here we have control secretion, wild-type alpha-synuclein inhibits that, the V70P is no longer able to inhibit that. 
So that's a uh, synopsis of uh, what was in a couple of previous papers. And now we'll move on to the paper at hand. This just shows, sorry, I forgot, that the V70P mutant in the SEM membrane binding assay eliminates the ability of helix-2 to bind consistent with the design, which was intended to disrupt this helix-2. So, so that was that was the, the idea. And the reason I show you that is because that mutant will be important in the subsequent work as well. So uh, as we were doing this work, we also wanted to know where alpha-synuclein is in these cells. Uh, and so we stained them for alpha-synuclein. And what we found, as I told you, that alpha-synuclein is quite cytoplasmic. Um, you don't really see it at the plasma membrane much, which was disappointing. But if you think about it, there are, you know, as I told you, it binds weakly to vesicles unless they're docked. And there are not very many docked vesicles uh, in these or in other cells typically. Uh, we did see some puncta, uh, bright puncta. Those turned out to be lipid droplets. And that had been reported before by Bob Nussbaum. And we also saw some degree of co-localization of mitochondria. So here we have a mitochondrial marker. Again, this is synuclein. And if you look at the merge, there's some degree of co-localization, although it's not spectacular. And this had also been seen before, uh, and we were not terribly excited about it at first. Uh, also, if you looked at immunogold, I showed you already immunogold showing that synuclein localizes to, uh, to the active zone, to dock vesicles. But if you look, you can also see it localizing to these objects here. And if you look at sort of other anatomical EM micrographs of synaptic, of presynaptic nerve terminals, then you readily see that these things are mitochondria. So there's, there's a fair amount of evidence for synuclein localized to mitochondria in the literature, usually under conditions of overexpression. And People, you know, some people have noted it and some people have contended that it may be interfering with mitochondrial function, which of course is very important uh, in Parkinson's disease and neurodegenerative diseases in general. So we saw this, but initially we weren't too excited. Now that changed when Richard Ewell from NIH, who I imagine some of you also know, came a while ago uh, to give a talk across the street on slow Kettering. And of course he's very famous for studying the pink Parkinson mitophagy pathway. And in particular, he showed beautiful movies. This is still not movies, but he showed beautiful movies where if you take Parkin in cells that are unstressed, it's very much cytoplasmic um, and there's no localization with mitochondrial markers, cytochrome C in this case. But if you stress the mitochondria, if you collapse the membrane potential of the mitochondria in these cells, all of the Parkin very dramatically relocalizes to the mitochondria. Of course, this is much more exciting in movies, um, but you can see it in stills as well. And that made me wonder in particular if anybody had ever tried this for alpha-synuclein, which has also been reported over the years to sort of associate with mitochondria. And we couldn't find any evidence that anybody had tried this. And so we tried this in our cells. And so this is an example of such an experiment where we stress these cells uh, with very low quantities of digitonin in this case. Uh, and we see uh, in contrast with this sort of marginal co-localization of mitochondria and unstressed cells, we see a much more dramatic co-localization uh, of alpha synuclein with a mitochondrial marker in these stress cells, you'll note that the mitochondria also change their shape, confirming that they are in fact being stressed. That's what they do when they're unhappy. Um, so this got us more interested in the possibility that alpha synuclein might be doing something interesting uh, at mitochondria. So uh, one of the things, of course, that particularly interested us was, you know, what was drawing synuclein to mitochondria? What was allowing it to localize to mitochondria? And so you know, we had just spent a lot of time showing that synuclein likes to bind to membranes, but it especially likes to bind tightly to membranes that are closely opposed. Uh, so initially we thought perhaps it enters the uh, inter inner space in the mitochondria between the outer and inner membrane and binds and bridges between those two membranes, but that distance is kind of far. And it would also have to cross the outer membrane somehow, and it wasn't really clear how that would happen. Um, so I'll tell you what our alternate hypothesis was, but before I tell you that, we wanted to test to see whether this co-localization of the mitochondria was sensitive to the types of tools that we uh, developed for altering the ability of the protein to bridge between two members, and particularly this V70P mutant, which really eliminates this ability, and another mutant, A30P, which it eliminates that ability as well, though not to quite the same extent. So here we have uh, Pearson's coefficients uh, measuring co-localization. Uh, these are Mandra's coefficients, sorry, doesn't matter. Co-localization with mitochondria for a control with no synuclein, stressed control with no synuclein, a cells that are, have uh, wild type alpha synuclein introduced into them, but without stress, I should say these RBL2H3 cells have undetectable levels of endogenous synuclein. So again, we put synuclein in, this is the uh, corresponds to the first images I show you, there is some co-localization mitochondria, but if we stress the mitochondria with the wild type protein, we get quite a bit more local co-localization. Here it's done with CCCP. The data I showed you before with digitonin is more dramatic, but digitonin is so much harsher. CCCP is the toxin that Richard Ewell used, so we decided to use that. But if you look at the V70P, neither uh, under conditions of no stress, but even under conditions of stress, do you see any significant co-localization? So this mutation, which was designed to 
uh, abrogate the ability of the protein to bridge between two membranes also eliminates the ability of the protein to relocalize to mitochondria either without stress or under stress. And A30P has a similar effect, although it's not quite as effective, consistent with our previous observation that this mutation also it affects binding to opposed membranes, but not as strongly. So this led us to think, again, that synuclein may be going to mitochondria, not just binding to the outer membrane on its own, but trying, to, you know, binding in a mode that involves two membranes. And since if it's not the inner, the outer membrane of the mitochondria, where else could there be an opportunity to bridge between two membranes? Uh, this called to our mind a paper by Serge Prezaborski and Eric Sean at Columbia that was published a while ago. Uh, the claim that my alpha synuclein can localize to ER mitochondrial contact sites, mitochondrial associated membranes, so-called MAM. And the gels that they showed in this paper, which I reproduce here, were very reminiscent of the gels that I showed you uh, led in part to our thinking that alpha synuclein or supported our idea that alpha synuclein can bridge between synaptic vesicles and membranes. In particular, if you look at these gels here, you see that when they do mitochondrial preparations from a variety of cells, human brain, mouse brain, if they look at mitochondria that still have membranes that's associated with them, there's a lot of alpha synuclein. But if they strip away the membranes, the alpha synuclein goes away. So this suggests that synuclein is not just going to the outer membrane of the mitochondria on its own, but it's actually requiring an additional nearby membrane, likely the ER membrane, in order to bind in this bridging mode, which is a tight binding mode. So that really underpinned the remainder of the study uh, that I'll describe to you um, in the last minutes that I have. Uh, so the idea that came out of this is that alpha synuclein could localize to ER mitochondrial contact sites, and it would do so by binding to these two closely opposed membranes, the mitochondrial membrane and the ER membrane. Okay, And so uh, we wondered, of course, that, you know, how could we test this? But more importantly, what would the consequence of this be? So ER mitochondrial contact sites are important for actually for a variety of different things, but the two things that they're most important for uh, are first for transfer of lipids from the ER to mitochondria, which is crucial for, for lipid biosynthesis, Kennedy pathway, etc. And second is for the transfer, transfer of calcium from the ER to the mitochondria, which is critical for mitochondrial calcium homeostasis that in turn is required for proper mitochondrial function. So we're quite interested in whether synuclein might affect lipid transfer, but that's much harder to measure. We're looking at that. But measuring calcium entry into mitochondria is relatively easy because there is GCAM6, which is a mitochondrial calcium sensor that's relatively easy to work with. So uh, that's what we did. We uh, transfected these cells with GCAM6 and then stimulated these cells. Uh, and so in cells that do not have alpha synuclein, when you stimulate them, what happens is you get a transfer of mitochondria uh, of, e of calcium from the ER into the mitochondria, a certain amount that we can measure using GCAM6. The movies. Um, uh, look like this. This is in the absence of alpha synuclein, you get some transfer. Uh, and if you transfect these cells with alpha synuclein and do the same experiment, then you see that there's a, sorry, that there is a lot more calcium taken up by the mitochondria after the cells are stimulated. Okay, so it seems that alpha synuclein enhances mitochondrial calcium entry from the ER, uh, at least in these cells under these conditions. And uh, Dave Loca and Barbara Baird, my collaborators, had previously worked with a protein called VAP-B, which is actually one of the proteins that's known to be a professional mitochondrial ER tether protein. So it's actually well established to be part of the bridge that keeps, you know, that anchors mitochondria to ER at these contact sites. And they had remembered that VAP-B does something similar. So we repeated in these cells under these conditions, the experiment where instead of synuclein, we added VAP-B and we saw a similar effect. So this again suggested to us that not only is, is alpha synuclein localizing to ER mitochondrial contact sites, but it might actually be acting as an ER mitochondrial tether to enhance or extend uh, these contact sites. And again, the two mutations that abrogate the ability of the protein to bridge between two membranes eliminated this enhanced calcium entry into the mitochondria. We also looked at whether the C-terminal tail of alpha synuclein, which is a known protein-protein interaction motif, and also contains serine-129, which is phosphorylated in Parkinson's disease, whether that's important, and that does not seem to be important for this effect, so that was useful for us to know. And I will note that there had been a previous publication that uh, recapitulated some of these things, but not the uh, structure function aspect of it, uh, and had not really considered the possibility that the protein bridges between these two membranes. So that was nice. Uh, we then asked if synuclein could be acting like VAP-B, like a tether, you would expect that it might extend mitochondrial ER contacts. So the best way to look at this is by EM, where you can actually see the contacts, but you can't really quantify those types of that approach, unfortunately. So we decided instead to use uh, super-resolution microscopy. And so we labeled the ER, we labeled the mitochondria. 
And uh, we simply looked for a co-localization, again, under conditions of super resolution microscopy. And we saw that when you transfect an alpha synuclein, you get an increased co-localization of ER and mitochondria. It's statistically significant. This uh, group had done something similar at lower using lower resolution microscopy and also seen a significant effect. Uh, so we feel this is likely real. And that in fact, when alpha synuclein is transfected into these cells, so here are the cells without alpha synuclein, they have some ER mitochondrial contact sites. When, you, when the cells also have alpha synuclein, it localizes these contact sites, but it also extends these contact sites. So it builds more ER mitochondrial contacts. And that may be the basis for the enhanced calcium entry in these cells when they're stimulated. So then of course, um, we thought to ourselves, that's all very nice, but the, the place where we really saw dramatic co-localization of the mitochondria was when we stressed the mitochondria. Okay, so what happens to calcium entry when we stress the mitochondria? So first we asked what happens to cells that don't have alpha synuclein. And so if you take these cells and don't stress them and stimulate them, there's some degree of calcium entry. It's a bit higher in this experiment than in the previous experiment. It varies from batch to batch of cells. But if you now stress these cells with CCCP, which again collapses the mitochondrial membrane potential, it's an ionophore, uh, you have to let them recover. They go haywire for a little while and then stimulate them. You see that they take up more calcium from the ER than they did uh, previous to prior to the stress. And this effect is very similar to what happens if you transfect unstressed cells with synuclein or with VAT-B. And again, we interpreted this effect to indicate that there are more mitochondrial ER contact sites. So this experiment led us to believe that if you take cells that don't have alpha synuclein and you stress them, that's indicated by the red mitochondria here, you stress the mitochondria, they respond by building more ER mitochondrial contact sites. This allows more calcium entry into the mitochondria, which presumably enables the mitochondria to recover from the conditions of stress. Uh, and then, you know, this is similar to what happens when you add alpha synuclein to the cells in the absence of stress. And so the next question, of course, is what happens when you combine mitochondrial stress in cells that have alpha synuclein? And we presume since either uh, change leads to more ER mitochondrial sites, contact sites, and more calcium entry, that combining them would give you even more. Uh, so that was the idea. Uh, but there we got a surprise. Okay. Uh, so here's what happens if you combine. CCCP stress with alpha synuclein transfection, you let the cells recover and you stimulate them, you get almost no calcium entry into these cells under these conditions. So it appears that in the presence of alpha synuclein, stressing the mitochondria leads to a situation where they're not able to recover and are not able to import calcium afterwards. So this was something new and something unexpected. Um, and of course, mitochondrial function is very important in disease. So it led us to think that this might be something that's relevant to disease. Uh, we were particularly interested in whether the C-terminal tail of the protein was important for this effect. Um, and also whether serine-129, which again is phosphorylated in Parkinson's disease was important for this effect. And they were. So if we lop off the C-terminal tail of alpha-synuclein, uh, then we no longer see this effect. So you, you have cells that have alpha-synuclein in them but it's missing its C-terminal tail. You stress the cells with CCCP, you let them recover and you stimulate them and they take up calcium like gangbusters, okay? So they're happy, they're, they're healthy. Same thing is true if you eliminate serine-129. If you mutate it to alanine, okay, and do the same experiment, uh, the mitochondria are, are very able to take up the calcium after recovery from stress. But in the wild type protein with the C-terminal tail and serine-129, that is not the case. They're not able to do so. At some point in the series of studies, we, you know, we decided it would be wise to look at other cells. So we repeated this experiment in N2A cells, which are, of course, more neuronal-like, even though they're not neurons. And we also decided to try a toxin that's more relevant to PD. So instead of using CCCP, we used MPP+, which is a complex one inhibitor uh, that's used oftentimes to model Parkinson's disease. And we saw the same thing in, in both of these, both these different cells and using this different toxin. The presence of alpha-synuclein eliminated the ability of mitochondria to recover from stress and import calcium. So uh, this led us to think that this may be a pathogenic or pathological effect. And of course, we wondered uh, what's going on to serine-129 or what's happening to serine-129. It is a phosphorylated disease. Is it becoming phosphorylated under these conditions? So we asked that question. There are good antibodies for S129P. Uh, so we asked what happens in these cells in the absence of stress. These, of course, have synuclein. Um, and so in the absence of stress, there's a baseline level of serine-129 phosphorylated alpha-synuclein uh, that we can quantify. But if we stress the cells and let them recover, add CCP and let them recover, we see that serine-129 phosphorylation does in fact go up considerably. So it seems that 
stressing these mitochondria leads alpha synuclein to become phosphorylate on serine 129. This is true in the N2A neuronal cells, and also if we use the alternate toxin as well. And then, of course, we wanted to ask if at some point we're also uh, triggering aggregation of the protein, because, of course, pathology is also includes aggregation. So we used an aggregation-specific antibody in the same kind of experiments. Uh, we looked at control cells. There's a baseline level that this antibody reports on, whether it's actually aggregation or not. You know, at this baseline condition is unclear to us. But if we add CCCP, we stress the mitochondria. Uh, we see a definite increase in the amount of aggregate that this antibody is able to detect. And if we do the same experiment with alpha synuclein, where serine 129 has been mutated to alanine, we no longer see this effect. The antibody is still able to recognize aggregates. It's not specific to this region. So we're not messing up the epitope, but we simply just don't get enhanced aggregation uh, when we stress cells that don't have serine 129. And this is true in the neuronal cells as well as in the RBL cells when we use the other toxin, MPPP+. So I'll wrap up here. Um, it appears that alpha-synuclein relocalizes to mitochondria. Uh, it does more so under conditions of mitochondrial cell stress, but in that case, something else happens, and it now prevents the ability of the mitochondria to uh, import calcium effectively after they recover from the stress. This requires the presence of the C-terminal tail of alpha-synuclein, and requires the presence of serine 129 and is associated with phosphorylation of serine 129 and also alpha synuclein aggregation. Now, what in all this is causal and what is the order of things? We don't know for sure. Our model is that synuclein, when mitochondria are stressed, they build more ER contact sites. Synuclein likes to go there, but when it goes there under these conditions, for some reason, it also becomes altered. We think it becomes phosphorylated on serine 129. When it becomes phosphorylated on serine 129, that allows it to somehow interfere with calcium uptake into the mitochondria from the ER. And we think eventually this leads to aggregation. We believe the aggregation is downstream because if you eliminate serine 129, we don't observe uh, this aggregation. So that's the, the model that we're working with now. And we have a couple ideas about mechanism, of course. So how does this happen? Why is synuclein phosphorylated here? And how does it interfere with calcium uptake? I'll skip this because I already told you. And so these, this is all hypothesis at this point. We haven't done experiments on this, but we know that alpha-synuclein is phosphorylated on serine 129 by a kinase called pololike -like kinase 2 or PLK2. And there are a number of papers out there that indicate that PLK2 is recruited to mitochondrial ER contact sites um, and activated at those sites under conditions of mitochondrial stress. So we think that that could be the reason why synuclein is phosphorylated under those conditions at those contact sites. And then how does it prevent calcium entry? Well, calcium to enter the mitochondria has to cross two membranes. It has to cross the inner membrane. And it does that by going through the mitochondrial calcium uniporter, MCU. To cross the outer membrane, it goes through the voltage dependent anion channel, VDAC. Okay. And there are a number of papers, again, indicating that alpha-synuclein can regulate VDAC ion transport. And it does so specifically through its C-terminal tail, which is highly negatively charged and interacts with the pore of VDAC, which is positively charged. And so if you phosphorylate alpha-synuclein on its C-terminal tail at serine 129, we believe that, that could influence the way it interacts with VDAC, and that could be responsible for the inhibition of calcium entry into the mitochondria under conditions of stress. So I will stop here. Uh, I think I've said everything I have to say. I've gone a little bit over. 20 minutes is hard. But uh, if there's time remaining for discussion, uh, I'll be happy to... Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting. And uh, we appreciate you going through the data, which is uh, also very interesting. Uh, there are a bunch of questions that have come in, but uh, I and please keep them coming in. Uh, I think some of them may have been quickly answered. Um, but uh, I just want to start with with the hard question, maybe first, <laughs> which is um, some of these cells, you know, they, they, they don't endogenously express alpha synuclein. And so we do know that the uh, differential expression levels of synuclein can have an impact. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? And I know you nicely did address that in the paper, but can you talk a little bit yes. about, you know, yeah. yeah. So when we, you know, that, that was something that we were concerned about from the very beginning. Um, and so in the 2019 paper, uh, we did both facts and quantitative Western blotting, uh, calibrating with known amounts of recombinant protein to establish what sort of expression levels we were getting. And we are somewhere in the 5 to 15 micromolar range of synuclein in these cells, which, you know, the physiological concentration, if you look up in papers, ranges usually typically from about 5 to sometimes 50, up as high as 50. Synuclein is a very is a fairly ubiquitous protein. So, um, so we think that we're in a reasonably 
physiological range and that we're not overexpressing the protein. And if you look in the literature, and again, we discussed this a fair amount in the paper, there are other papers that have looked at the effects of alpha-synuclein on calcium entry into mitochondria and have seen more or less the opposite result. And we believe that that is a consequence of different protein expression levels. And, and um, there's even one group that's seen both, both seeing things similar to our results and things sim you know, in the opposite of their own results and our results. And again, if you look carefully, it's when they're, when they're expressing things at higher levels. So when you express the nuclein at higher levels, then you enter a different regime of behavior. Uh, and we think that there you may be getting aggregation in the absence of mitochondria. We're not really sure. You're getting more membrane association. You can have different things happening. So we showed, for example, that the effects of vesicle release at high concentration are quite different than at low concentration in our 2019 paper and you know, presented a model for how they may be operating. Uh, what may be going on in, with the relation to mitochondria at higher expression levels, we haven't looked into that ourselves yet, so I can't say, uh, you know, what happens there. But, you know, we, we feel that um, we're on the lower end of the expression levels. And so, uh, you know, even though these cells don't have synuclein, these are the types of levels that you would have in cells that do have synuclein. Yeah, makes sense. Um, is Are there plans to do this kind of tighter just to see, you know, Yeah, we would love to do that. Uh, you know, these... Science is very slow, at least in my lab. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, in general. Uh, well, any interesting thing you do leads to 10 more questions that yeah. <laughs> need yeah, to be able to can choose. So <laughs> part of the problem is that, uh, you know, Barbara is closing down her lab. So we're trying to import more of the cell biology into my lab, but we're traditionally a in vitro structural biology lab. So it's a bit challenging for us. But yes, we fully intend uh, to try to look at the effects of, of different levels um, because we're quite interested in why things change. Right. And I think it's especially interesting, you know, it, it, that's always a question that we have with, with overexpression models, whether it's physiologically relevant or not. But with synuclein, it's extra interesting because duplications and triplications can, uh, you know, cause Mendelian forms of the disease. So it, it's sort of, you know, tweaking it even just a little bit, you know, to double or, or yeah. so can yeah, have no, we, we, you know, we Absolutely. We, you know, we like to think that even duplication and triplications, you start at five micromolar still leaves you at a relatively modest range. And so we try not to spend too much time in, in, in the very high concentration range for that reason. Right. Um, yeah. I like uh, that you address that right away in the paper. Is well, that think, <laughs> that's yeah, always think, a question. I'm sure you, yes, you have I should, I should, I should mention in the talk as well, of course, because that's, uh, you're right. So. Well, but you know, that, then I have the question to ask you. So um, Andy is asking, uh, actually we have several questions. Uh, He's asking what might be the purpose of preventing exocytosis to some of the, the stuff he talks about, the synaptic vesicles. Is this uh, stabilizing vesicles in a steady state? If so, what might be the triggering for the release? And I, I kind of want to add to that too, because synuclein, first of all, synuclein knockouts are like mostly, I know there are some deficits, particularly when it comes to synaptic vesicle exocytosis actually, but they're mostly okay. And then invertebrates don't have synuclein. So can you talk a little bit about what the physiological function would be outside of Parkinson's disease? Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, we, we wish we knew. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing that's probably the most useful thing to keep in mind is that synuclein is is been shown to be important in, in synaptic plasticity and, and especially in songbirds. There's a famous paper by David Clayton showing that it's important for Before Parkinson's. <laughs> uh, that's right. So, um, but but how exactly, so, you know, so we assume, you know, synuclein knockout mice are very normal. Uh, you have to work really hard to, you know, there are subtle changes, uh, different groups of reported, even, even the original Asa Bilyevich paper, there were changes to paired pulse stimulation response and, and you know, but you have to be a real neuroscientist to pick up those kind of things. And more, you know, you can't tell by looking at the mice for sure. Um, you know, there's also interesting work from Colorado suggesting that it may be, a, you know, an antiviral protein that nuclear knockout mice are more susceptible to viral infection, as you guys know. Um, and, and that may also be related more to endocytosis, probably than to exocytosis, but to mechanisms of viral escape from, from endocytic vesicles, potentially. Um, so, you know, we, we presume we're, we're under the hopefully not false premise that synuclein is not an appendix of nature and that it's, you know, especially since it doesn't, you know, descend from, from ancient organisms, it's something that we picked up as vertebrates. And um, so we, we assume it's there for a function and that it's just, you know, there's some evolutionary advantage to having alpha synuclein and you have to know how to write, you know, put the mouse under the right circumstance to observe that advantage or, or to see what that does. And, but deciphering that is, is not easy. You know, if you take a random protein from the proteome and ask, what does it do? It turns out generally to be a pretty hard question to answer. Um, and people are very happy if the knockout mice are dead, but that's actually, you know, it means it's important, but it's also relatively boring. It wouldn't be Parkinson's disease then, right? It would be something much more, much more lethal. And Parkinson's disease is not something evolutionary that's important in any way. 
Uh, nature doesn't care about Parkinson's disease, so, that, so there's no evolutionary pressure to prevent synuclein from doing what it does in PD. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things, we study a protein called complexin in the lab as well. So they're not, you know, synuclein is so unimportant that when you knock it out of mice, not much changes in terms of other protein levels, but there are a few proteins whose levels change. Snare proteins change, suggesting again that it's involved in vesicle release. And one of the proteins whose levels reliably change in response to changes in synuclein level and vice versa is a protein called complexin, which is another regulator of synaptic vesicle exocytosis, okay? And so we were very excited for a while in thinking that the two proteins could perhaps overlap in function. And in particular, we have a, a worm physiologist in the department who we collaborate with in complexin. And complexin knockouts have very interesting phenotypes. And we tried to see whether synuclein would rescue those. And it was an N of one experiment and it wasn't really done quite properly, but the result was disappointing. And so I've never been able to convince them to give it another shot. <laughs> um, so, so at least that, you know, at first blush, synuclein does not, cannot replace complexin um, in C. elegans. Uh, what, what, and in particular, what complexin does there is inhibit vesicle release and getting back, sorry, to Andy's question, vesicle release has to be very carefully orchestrated. You don't really want vesicles releasing, you know, in an unregulated fashion in the brain. And so there is, you know, they, there's so-called spontaneous release, which generally you want to, to tamp down, which is what complexin does. And then, of course, when vesicles should be released, when there's a stimulus that comes in, and that's usually an action potential, leads to calcium um, channels opening. And so calcium is the ultimate signal that leads to vesicle release. Uh, complexin actually also enhances that. So it actually basically acts as sort of an amplifier, it tamps down noise and amplifies signal. Whether synuclein does something similar is not clear. There's interesting work from Rob Edwards' lab, who's one of the few other people in the world who's interested in what the normal function of alpha synuclein might be, suggesting that it might influence the fusion pore itself. So this is getting you know into real nitty gritty of how do the membranes fuse. Um, and, uh, and there they see, it's the only really paper I know where there's a relatively consistent effect of the Parkinson's disease mutations on any measure. Generally, they give you know quite different effects. You know, for example, aggregation, they have opposite effects, many of them. Uh, so that makes it interesting perhaps. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, in terms of how do you integrate that into synaptic plasticity or, or brain function, that's very difficult to do. Um, so I can't say more than that, I think. Um, can I, I just would like to follow that up with a couple of other questions that are related to what you said. One is, um, you know, I think it makes sense. I, I think we tend to like the proteins to be doing something very specific to that particular uh, part of the pathway, for example, synaptic vesicles, and we then don't like it when it does something in mitochondria, but it could actually be a very similar type of action that it does in both places. Um, so with that, have you looked at other organelles besides the ER and, and mitochondria to see if it just helps with tethering in general, or yeah. is it very specific no. to synaptic vesicles and plasma membrane and also um, uh, mitochondria and ER? We haven't, but we think that that would be an interesting place to look. So, I, you know, so, you know, for example, I'm sure you guys know more better than I, all the PD genes, but VPS 13B, I think is a Parkinson's gene. And the VPS family is now pretty well established as lipid transfer proteins at contact sites between organelles. I think B is lysosomal lipid droplet or lys I don't remember which one it is. And so we're, you know, we're quite interested in the possibility that synuclein does this in other contact sites. Um, but we haven't actually had the time or the resources to look at anything specific. There, as I, I mentioned, that it also co-localizes to lipid droplets. Right. Um, and again, nobody there, we, we have not looked, I don't even think of, we've looked to see in our mutants, which we probably have data for, and we, you know, so we actually probably have that data for those mutants that, you know, sort of seem to selectively impair the ability of the protein to bridge between membranes, whether the lipid droplet look co-localization disappears or not or is in fact mm. that would actually be something mm. that, that would be interesting to, to see uh, <laughs> yeah. i know every uh, every answer uh, elicits 10 more questions yeah yeah that but that's is... a, we have data for that so we should definitely do that so I'll, I'll do that when we get off here so um for the uh for the mutants as well i know for the um the wild type you showed uh, kind of the response to cccp um yeah. did you do that for the mutants as well or uh, Particularly we, the Parkinson's mutants. No, A30P. Uh, only well, A thirty P is a PB mutant. Right, right, but I didn't see that for the the CCCP experiments. I think that was for the earlier experiments, right? Sorry, not for the calcium uptake. Right. Uh, yeah, we uh, we no right. Sorry, so 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 the co localization with CCCP, we did A thirty P. Okay. Uh, and V seventy P, and and so that was early on. No calcium yet, just co localization, and uh, they both eliminate co localization. And then we also showed that for the wild type protein, which enhances calcium entry, V70P and A30P eliminate that. Right. Presumably because they eliminate co-localization. So we did not do the 
mitochondrial stress CCP experiments as well for those two mutants because we assume that the protein is not there anymore. Right. Because it's not there in the imaging and it doesn't have the effect in the absence of stress. But to be complete, we should have done them. You know, it's just that there's limited resources. So. Right, right. It makes sense. I think you want to go for the high, higher priority questions because it's yeah. likely to be similar. Um, I have 10 more questions, but I'm going to grab some from the <laughs> from the Q&A here. Sure. Um, uh, how long do you let the cells recover after CCCP before measuring? The paper said several hours, but I wonder if you're monitoring for some recovery signal before quantification. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the details of that that well. I know that we did do some, we did look at the cells immediately, you know, sort of after acute um, treatment, and uh, you know, we got fairly irreproducible results. And so I, we, you know, the cells I think were still, as as I said, going haywire is a technical way of putting it. Um, so I don't think we did any sort of, you know, like let's check every 15 minutes to see, um, you know, to see if there's some indication that they've calmed down or things are good again, as far as I, if that was done, I don't, you know, that was buried in the journal of books and anything else. So I can't answer that question very well. I think we settled on on that amount of time as that's, this seems to work, but I don't think we did a careful study of what would be the optimal time for that. Gotcha. Um, another question Ed, I would like the answer to this as well. Have you looked at any related mitochondrial dynamics like mitophagy or biogenesis to see if either one is altered with the synuclein yeah. expression? If not, could this be applied to something like mitoQC cells where we can easily measure that? Yeah. Yeah. I think the answer we have not, and I think it could be, I mean, what we really wanted to do was sort of look, see what's going on with Parkin at the same time. Presumably, you know, I think Parkinson is a much more generally present protein. Uh, mitophagy is a general process. And so I assume that when we, you know, Richard Ewell will tell us that if we add CCCP to these cells, that Parkinson is doing the same thing. And so there should be changes in mitophagy going on. And, uh, you know, he has these, he has these cool mutator mice where you get uh, DNA stress on a subpopulation of the mitochondria. And he then subsequently showed that it's only that population that, so you don't need to add CCP, you can add, you can induce mitochondrial stress internally and only those mitochondria attract Parkinson. So I would love to do that experiment with synuclein uh, but we've not had a chance to, you know, this only came out a few weeks ago, so we were busy writing the rebuttals, you know, a couple of months ago still. So um, yeah, yeah. Um, I have seen, uh, I, I think that would be a fruitful experiment because I have seen some unpublished data from various, from two actually different groups showing that at least with the PFFs, the preformed fibrils, um, you do increase um, mitophagy in a dose dependent manner. So the more PFFs you have, so it does kind of seem to be a um, there seems to be a relationship there. And then also there have been a couple of uh, papers published, one with um, PINK1 activation and one with USB30 inhibition, which just came out re very recently, um, showing that you reduce levels of phosphorylated synuclein if you can increase mitophagy. So it seems, and, and that maybe leads into another That's question, it. which is <laughs> how do you think um, the the CCCP or, you know, the mitochondrial dysfunction is leading to more phosphorylated alpha synuclein. And you mentioned this a little bit, but there seems to be kind of a, a, a bi-directional relationship there with the two. Yeah, no, that, 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 those results you mentioned would be consistent with our idea that we think at this point, we think the phosphorylation happens at the ER mitochondrial contact sites. And we think it's because PLK2 gets recruited there. So it's involved in phosphorylating neros, which is this, uh, you know, uh, complex of, of proteins, um, that it actually extends from the outer mitochondrial membrane to the inner mitochondrial membrane and is involved in a variety of, of things related to mitochondrial function. Um, and it appears to be also activated under mitochondrial stress. So we think that, you know, synuclein is going there for a different reason initially, but it encounters PLK2 there under conditions of stress, then becomes phosphorylated, then does something that it shouldn't do, probably via VDAC, although, so that's something, you know, that's, that's one direction that we're very excited about because that's a, an in vitro type of experiment that we can tackle you know, ourselves more easily than we can some of the cell biology. Um, and so we have a colleague who works on VDAC. We have samples in the fridge right now that are waiting to, you know, to look at some nuclear interactions and how they depend on phosphorylation, whether they influence um, VDAC conduction. Um, yep. So we think that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, that would be very interesting to show the exact mechanism. And speaking of VDAC, we had a question, and I'm sorry, I'm skipping some questions, no. but um, VDAC tends to oligomerize and form a pore on the mitochondrial membrane. Did you look into the oligomerization status of VDAC in the presence of alpha synuclein wild type? Yeah, yeah you know, we, we we're well aware of the fact that VDAC tends to oligomerize because it's, you know, for us in vitro people, it's not something that we like, we prefer. So, we, so we've worked very hard. These samples in the fridge, are we worked hard to make them monomeric, not oligomeric. Um, but oligomerization may be important for VDAC function. And so we had not really planned on looking to see whether alpha synuclein alters how VDAC oligomerizes, but it's not a bad idea. Um, 
So I'll add that to my long list of things to consider. <laughs> list of ideas to go. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, let's see. Um, does high cal okay, so I think you already answered this question. I'm gonna skip that. Um, with serine 129, do mitochondria still localize near the ER and just not tether, or do they not even go in that direction? Uh, we didn't we didn't do imaging for that condition. I, you know, I presume that um, you know, again, we think there are ER mitochondrial contact sites without any alpha synuclein being present. They're, you know, they're sort of part of the fundamental cell biology. And so when we introduce alpha synuclein, we think we make more. Um, and I don't think that eliminating, you know, under conditions of no stress, I don't think eliminating serine 129 would probably have an effect, um, is my guess, since we can lop off the whole C terminus and it doesn't seem to have much effect. Um, so, uh, so then under conditions of stress, uh, we, again, that, to then look at mitochondria, quantify mitochondrial ER contact sites after the cells recover from stress, where synuclein, right, where there, there's no calcium entry, is it is it that we have actually broken that we haven't we haven't done that we haven't uh, looked at that that it's a reasonable experiment to ask, you know again I'm proposing that uh, that synuclein is now blocking VDAC at the contact sites and that's what's preventing calcium entry but it's possible that again there there, there are many other there's quite a number of, there's like three or four different tether systems for holding these contact sites together and this is true for all the various contact sites. So right. there's VAP-B, and FF, FFT motif, I think, F, yeah, FFAT motif that binds to, I forget the other protein. I think it's um, the, uh, that doesn't matter. So there's, there's several systems and I don't think we're likely to perturb those. So it, you know, my guess would be that we're not sort of, you know, driving mitochondria away from the ER by phosphorylating synuclein at, at uh, serine-129, but it's not impossible. So. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, on that too, uh, what about mitochondria that may be at the axon terminal regions? So I'm assuming most of this is happening in the cell body region. Yeah, yeah. So that's always, you know, I think a still big question in PD and neurodegenerative disease is where, where, what's the important thing to focus on? And you know, my feeling is that the the nerve terminals are where you know where things have to be important. But there are mitochondria at nerve terminals, and there's ER, and there's some people sometimes forget that. Or maybe people didn't know that. So for a long time, people didn't think there was ER and they probably didn't think there were mitochondria. So the mitochondrial images I showed you were at nerve terminals, clearly documenting mitochondria there. Um, and it's it's pretty, you know, it's well accepted now. There's there's work from a variety of groups showing that there are mitochondria, you know, your, your average bouton um, has a high probability of having a mitochondria nearby. And there's plenty of, course, of yeah, nearby. Yeah. Now where but the, you know, the overlap images were mostly in this were done in the cell body region. No, no, right? no, 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 that wasn't the, right. The, I'm the, um, the 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 EM micrographs that I showed to demonstrate what micro what mitochondria look like at nerve terminals to show that the immunogold was in fact showing. That's not that's not our data, but those were at nerve terminals. All of no, we have no data on this of our own at nerve terminals at all yet. They're much smaller. You have to culture the neurons. It's not you know people don't do it. It's not a big deal, but it takes a while to get it up and running, and the imaging is harder. So we have so far not not gone there, although, you know, every single paper we've submitted on a topic, the reviewers have complained, you know, that <laughs> it wasn't me, I promise. Um, <laughs> but but your hypothesis would be that uh, it would be the same in, in both. Yes, no, we, we, we expect that the same thing will be going on. There's no reason to believe why it'd be, you know, operating differently. At, but but where is it more important? You know, we, we don't know if, if it's important at all. Of course, we don't know that. Um, and we do have more questions, but maybe we'll just limit to two more. Um, Kayla asks, are there differences in alpha synuclein's influence on mitochondrial calcium uptake between different cell types? Well, the three, so we looked at three cell types, RBL2H3, N2A, and HEK cells, and it's, things seem to be very similar there as far as we could tell. Um, now, have you looked at could, microglia or any of those no, types? Yeah, no, we've not looked at any, any glial cell. You know, I mean, you know, so you could sort of imagine the RBL2H3 are supposed to be a model for mast cells, which are an immune type cell. Mm -hmm. I don't, but I don't know if they're macrophage, you know, sort of models. They're actually, they're not even, they're really a cancer cell. So, you know, there's a retinoblastoma cell. So people say they're a model for immune system cells, but it's not even clear if they're that. They secrete a lot is what they do. Right. We've not looked at microglia. You know, synuclein in glial cells is, an, you know, a whole interesting topic, NSA in particular, how it gets there. I don't think it's very highly expressed, as I recall. So... It, so how it even gets in there is sort of not really clear, so. Right, makes sense. Um, and then I, I know you don't fully know the answer to this, but do you have any thoughts on which lipids might be getting transferred? I know we, we talked a lot about the calcium transfer, but. Yeah, well, so there, you know, the, the Kennedy pathway, you know, there's also a source of sort of very fundamental cell biology and lipid transfer from mitochondria to the ER. 
uh, what is affected by synuclein, you know, in the absence of anything synuclein has to do with it. Whether synuclein would affect something specifically, no, I, we don't have any guesses yet. We don't even know if it has an effect. We do have, again, uh, same colleague who works on VDAC uh, is interested in these topics. So we're trying to write something up for Michael J. Fox to look at this uh, because it'll take a fair amount of work. Um, but yeah, Lipids are not easy, but they're very interesting. So yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of body literature that suggests that synuclein is closely tied to lipid homeostasis and that would fit right in with because a lot of lipid homeostasis happens in this particular context. Yep. Um, yeah. So we think this could be also an, an interesting direction. Um, so we just need infinite resources. That's all. Makes sense. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much again for uh, taking the time to speak with us and for answering all the questions. Uh, I think that, you know, this is a really interesting area. And of course, if we can be of any help, you know, we're mostly on the mitochondrial side, but, you know, you can't, uh, I think you can't work on Parkinson's without thinking about alpha-synuclein. So uh, definitely keep us in mind if we can be of any help in the, in the work that you do. Absolutely. I will do so. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Nice to meet you.